Okay, so we are continuing on looking at limits and looking at limits, solving them algebraically. So last week we started with this and we had looked at these limit laws. And there was different laws basically that if you have a limit of a sum that's equal to the limit of um, the sum of each piece. We have the limit, basically these two pieces here are, are helpful. You have the limit as x approaches c of f of x. This is equal to some constant. Or sorry, this is equal to l. I'm, that's not what I was going to say. <laughs> I was guessing what it was, but it, that's not what it says. So if you're looking at a limit as x approaches c of f of x, and that's equal to l, and you look at a limit of another piece function, g of x, and that gives you back m, basically the sum rule says you can break this down as two separate limits, and you would get l plus m. We don't want to go through that every single time. And so we can basically just plug in the value wherever we see the x in our limit. So for instance, maybe let's try this example 16. And so that says we're looking at the limit here as x is approaching 2 thirds of a function. 8 minus 3, I'm going to put the, uh, that's an x, it says s there, but we're going to use x, um, in parentheses, all times 2x minus 1. So all we really have to do is go in here, plug in our value, wherever, that 2 thirds, wherever we see an x in this function. And so this would equal 8 minus 3 times that x which is 2 thirds, all times the quantity 2 times x, which is the 2 thirds, minus 1. Okay, so this is where rules, um, order, um, operations, rules of operations, order of operations is important. And so parentheses, we want to work in the parentheses first. Multiplication comes before any addition or subtraction. And so inside here we have 8 minus, we'll notice that this we can think of as 3 over 1, so those 3's cancel. And so we're left inside the upper first parentheses, 8 minus 2. And so our second parentheses, nothing simplifies with this 2 times the 2 thirds. So multiplication fraction, multiply straight across, you get 4 thirds minus I know when I'm adding or subtracting fractions, I need a common denominator. So we're just going to manipulate and rewrite one so that it has that common denominator, which is 3 thirds. So 8 minus 2, this gives us 6, all times 4 thirds minus 3 thirds, and that reduces to 1 third. And so we would can reduce 6 times 1 third gives us back 2. Okay, so the limit as x approaches 2 thirds of that function gives us back 2. Okay, so any time that right now, whenever you're looking at a limit like this, as x approaches a value, that's the first thing that you want to do is plug in that value for that variable and see if you get back a result like a whole number, or not actually, it doesn't have to be a whole number, but an, a real number, or is that going, giving you something that's undefined, or it may give you some form which is called an indeterminate. And so the indeterminate form, so if we're taking a limit and we get one of these forms, we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to manipulate this function so that when we do go back in and take the limit and plug in our value, it gives us um, not the indeterminate form. Okay, so let me just tell you what would happen and what you're looking for. Okay, so indeterminates. If you get something in the form where it's zero over zero, this doesn't tell us anything. And so we're going to manipulate it and um, try the limit again. If you get something where you have infinity over infinity or any sort of like maybe negative infinity over infinity. Okay. 
So maybe I should say. And then there's some other ones, but we'll look at those um, later in the course. So it's okay if you have zero in the numerator and a number other than zero in the denominator. We call that's always equal to zero. And if you had gotten in some number over zero, we call that that's an undefined. And so um, that would tell us something. But if it's zero both in the numerator and denominator, that's where we're going to have to look at this. Okay, so let me pull up a couple more, or pull up some examples where we would get that form. While you're, if you get this form, a couple of things that are helpful that you can try that will manipulate and hopefully um, help you so it doesn't stay in this form. One thing that you can try is factoring both the numerator and denominator. So if you have a rational function, Okay, so for rational functions, well, kind of it's funky how, how I wrote that, but for rational functions, um, there's a couple of things that you can try factoring. Both the numerator and denominator. And so hopefully once you factor that numerator and denominator, you'll notice that you have a like factor. And that could be a reason why you got zero over zero, right? You plug in a number. Um, and so factoring both the numerator and denominator and cancel like factors. You may be dealing with a rational function and you might have a radical actually in that rational function. And so sometimes a trick is um, rationalizing that numerator or rationalizing that denominator. So that's where we're getting rid of either the radical and the numerator denominator. So with rational functions, it's possible that you might have to rationalize either. The numerator or denominator. So maybe we can just quickly go over kind of a review of what I'm talking about there. So for example, let's say maybe we had the square root of three minus x all over um, x minus three. And actually, let's look at this. Okay, forget it about that for now. But um, no, let's do it. How about it was a limit as x is approaching? three. That's not going to work. Let me see. We're going to say that th this right here is also the, the numerator is square root of three minus the square root of x. There we go. Okay, so if we did direct substitution in here, and we plugged in three, wherever we see an x in here, notice that we get that in determinant form. So we would get the square root of three minus the square root of three all over three minus three. Which gives us back zero over zero. So this is an indeterminate form. So we're going to manipulate. And so let's do some side works. Let's rationalize. Notice it's the radical that's in the numerator. So we're going to rationalize the numerator. And so we want to get rid of that radical in the numerator. The 
Does anyone remember how to do that? How can we get rid of a radical? Do you uh, multiply it by root three plus X on top bottom? Yes. So because it's an expression, we just can't cancel the denominator. We can multiply this by a fancy one. And you got root three plus root X. You're looking at the conjugate. So basically uh, you have two terms that conjugate of, of those two terms is the opposite sign in between. So square root of three plus square root of X. So we need to multiply this by a fancy one. So we're gonna multiply by both the numerator and denominator by that. When you're doing this, using this trick, do not um, distribute out um, the piece that is not the conjugate. Keep it in that factored form. But we're gonna um, distribute and simplify the numerator. Well, the whole reason why we're doing that is kind of going back to the fact, right? If you have a minus b times a plus b, this was the factored form of a squared minus b squared. So we have something in this form of a minus b. Here we have something in the form of a plus b. And so basically we could just take that term, that first term and square it. Well, if you're gonna square a square root, that radical always is gonna cancel. So our a value in this case is root three minus, and that um, quantity squared minus the square root of x quantity squared. All over our numerator. And again, we're gonna keep that numerator in factored form. So x minus three, that quantity to all times the quantity square root of three plus square root of x. Okay, well, if I, again, if I square square root, you're just left with what's underneath the radical, which is called the radicand. So the square root of three squared is three, minus the square root of x squared is x, all over x minus three, that factor all times the factor root three plus square root of x. Okay, so we just manipulated this expression right here. And so we're just gonna rewrite our limit to what, how we have just manipulated it. So this would now be the limit uh, as x approaches three of three minus x all over x minus three all times the square root of three plus the square root of x. So we can do the exact same thing we had done before, but notice again, when you go back in and you plug in three wherever you see an X, you're gonna get three minus three in the numerator, right? That's equal to zero, all over three minus three for this factor, which is zero, times square root of three plus square root of three, which is two root three. So indeterminate form, and that means again, you need to manipulate it. So does anyone see how we can manipulate what we just have? Can you factor out um, negative one from the top and then cancel? Right, so notice that our numerator three minus x almost looks like the same factor down here, x minus three. They're just off by a negative one. And so if you factored out that negative one from the numerator, or it could be the denominator either way, but I'm gonna do it in the numerator. If we pull out a negative one here, we'd be left with x minus three all over x minus three. I just rewrote the order keeping the signs with the correct terms. You could have written this as negative three plus X, same thing. These cancel. And so now when you go in and you plug in three wherever you see an X, notice that we get a number. So here we would get negative one is left in our numerator all over root three plus square root replace x with three. 
So this is equal to negative one all over two root three. So a lot of times in math, we don't like radicals in our denominator. And so it's possible that they're gonna want your answers so, um, to have it where you, there's no radicals in the denominator. So we gotta rationalize the denominator here. It's kind of different than how we rationalize the numerator here. How are we gonna get rid of that radical in the denominator here? What is the fancy one we're gonna multiply that so that radical goes away. So this probably was in that skills check on chapter two, just to make sure that you guys had that algebra to be able to come in here and do some of the, the, the calculus. And so here- Root three over root three. Exactly. So root three all over root three. So our fancy one. And so this is equal to negative root three all over two times, root three times root three is just three, or negative root three all over six. And we can't simplify the three and the six because they're both not underneath a radical. Sorry, could you go over where you got the negative one one more time? Um, yes. So up here in this step, right, this line right here. Notice that in the numerator, we have three minus x. And in the denominator, we have um, a factor x minus three. So those oh, are- Oh, so you reversed them. Yeah, by pulling okay. out a negative one. So that I, I miss that. manipulate it to be the same. Okay, I see. Any other questions on that? So that actually was a great example where we had to, um, we got the indeterminate multiple times and then we had to manipulate it so that we finally got something that fell out. So, and it was also a way we had to factor and rationalize the denominator, so. I did a good job just kind of pulling that out of my head. I'll pat myself in the back, joking. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm trying to think, going back to giving you tips on how to manipulate your function if we get zero over zero or infinity over infinity when we're looking at limits. And so factoring is one way that that could be helpful. Rationalizing either the numerator or denominator can also be helpful. Sometimes you might be dealing with complex fractions. And so simplifying it, so you got a fraction, um, uh, sorry, simplifying your complex fraction so that it's just a single fraction versus fractions within the fraction. So, if you are dealing with complex fractions. Then try rewriting it as a single fraction. So let me see if I can pull an example of that. And I try to open up a different computer to see if, yeah, that I have problems in here. Let's see. Okay, so let's look at the following. The limit as x is approaching two. And it's a rational function, and that rational function, the numerator is x squared minus seven x plus 10. And that numerator, we get back 
is x minus 2, or is that something what it is? OK, so first thing you would do normally is just go in there, plug in where you're approaching. What In this case, we're approaching 2, wherever you see an x in our function, and then simplify. So we have 2 squared minus 7 times 2 plus 10, and that's all over 2 minus 2. So that's 4 minus 14 plus 10, all over 0, 0 over 0. OK, so this is where we want to go in and manipulate our limit. So in mathematics, it's really important to, when you're writing things down that you're re writing things that are, are correct statements. Um, and so make sure that you're pulling down the limit until you go in. Like notice in this equal sign, I don't have the limit anymore because I plugged in my value that the limit was approaching. But here, when I'm going to go rewrite this, I'm going to rewrite it with my limit in here. And so this is the limit, and I'm going to try by factoring. So I see I have a trinomial in the numerator, x squared minus 7x plus 10. So looking for two numbers that multiply to positive 10, but add to negative 7. So negative 2 and negative 5. So just like I wanted, we have a like factor in the numerator denominator. So this right here would give us the same value as our original limit if we just looked at the limit as x approaches 2 of just x minus 5. And so technically, see how I have parentheses around that x minus 5 there? It's because if I didn't write that parentheses, it would really be just saying the limit as x approaches 2 of x. After you evaluate that, then subtract 5. And so the further you go in mathematics, we're going to get, I mean, we're going to be more picky of little errors like that. So if you were back in my maybe intermediate algebra class, I might have knocked off a half a point, but here I might be more, more stringent on you guys showing your work properly. So a um, little sidetrack note, but now we'll go back in and plug in 2 wherever you see an x. We have 2 minus 5 which gives us a real number, which is negative 3. So our original limit, if we looked at this x squared minus 7x plus 10 all over x minus 2, and maybe that's a good thing to go look at. So let's look at the graph of that. We'll notice that as x is getting closer and closer to 2 on the left and the right, we're going to be getting closer and closer to a y value of negative 3. So just kind of to hide in the graph part of it. A separate page. Okay. And Professor, I had a quick okay, question. So I'm going. Yeah. Um, were those uh, three uh, different problems for that example, or was that all the same example? So that was all the same. Um, well, there was two examples there. Let me just pull that back up that screen real quick. Um, for that one example that had like the square root of 3 minus the square root of x all over x minus 3, I think that was it. That was one whole problem, and we had to manipulate it three separate times in order to get that result where you got a real number back when we. Oh, so you had to factor it in that second part? Yep. Oh, OK. By I see. pulling out that negative one. So this is all the same example. So you have to keep doing it until you get a real number then? Exactly. Or you get something that's undefined. So if you had gotten a number over 0, then you would have gotten that it's undefined there. And so maybe what's happening in this case, what would have been happening if it was undefined is that you have a vertical asymptote. 
and we might have to review a little bit about graphs and rational functions and um, where vertical asymptotes occur or holes. So based on how the equation is set up, um, all limbs should have, or all limits should have um, a real positive number, right? So um, either two things are gonna happen. You're either gonna get a real number back something after you manipulate it, or you're gonna get something undefined like um, five over zero. So if it isn't zero over zero, then you're good. If you get like something, a uh, number other than zero over zero, then you could just say stop and say it's undefined. Got it, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then this one was just a different example. All we had to do in this case was just factor at one time. And when we went back in to plug in X after that factored form, it came to be a real number. And Got so it, thank you. Back. Yep. So I want to go in and now just graph this for you guys and just kind of show it graphically. And so I'm going to go to desmostart.com. And I think I maybe spelled it wrong. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to put in the function that we were looking at. So f of x or y equals our numerator, it was x squared minus 7x plus 10. And our denominator, we had x minus 2. And so we were looking at the limit as x approaches 2 here. And so if we're going in when x is approaching 2, sorry. So if we're following this graph as x is approaching 2 here, notice that our y value that we're hitting is the negative 3 value. We're coming in and hitting there, and we're coming in here. So technically, this graph should have an open circle here, but just the program, it's, you know, it just feeds that they're getting close. But notice if I put, oops, let's see if I can put it at 2. It should say that it's undefined. If I can hit that right value. So notice when it was 2, it popped in there that it was undefined. So technically that graph, if you're graphing it on paper, you should have an open circle there. But the limit does exist and it's getting closer and closer to negative three or it is negative three. Okay, so let me pack, put back up the notes. Let me see about pulling another one. prefer it when it, the pen's a little thicker. So let's see. I want to do hard problems. Okay, so here's another kind of example. So if we look at the limit here, as x is approaching zero, our numerator has two fractions. The first fraction in the numerator is one all over x minus one. And then that's one fraction. And then in between, so you have a plus sign in between the other fraction which is one all over x plus one. And then this, that's your whole numerator and your denominator is just x. So always start with direct substitution. You might get a real number when you start. And so if we go in here and we plug in zero wherever we see an x,
So simplifying, I get one over negative one, which is just negative one, plus the second fraction reduces as one over one, which is just one, all over zero. So I can see right here, I'm getting zero over zero again. So that didn't tell me anything and I have to try to manipulate it. Okay, so I wanna simplify this so it's not a complex fraction. So I wanna get the, rid of the fractions within the, within the fractions. There's two ways that you guys can approach that. I'm gonna tell you the first way, which I normally do not do. And usually when students do it this way, they tend to make a mistake sometimes. Um, we can manipulate this. Think again of order of operations. If we were to combine the numerator um, in order to add one over x minus one plus one over x plus one, we need a common denominator. And so you'd have to get a common denominator, add your numerators together. And then once this is the numerator up here is a single fraction, then we can think of a fraction divided by a fraction is the same thing as your numerator times the reciprocal. I think that's a lot longer than going through and manipulating it by multiplying this by a fancy one. And so that fancy one that you're gonna use is gonna be the LCD, your least common denominator of all the fractions within this main fraction. And so if I look at this, I only have two fractions within this main fraction, one over X minus one, and one over x plus one. And so if I find my LCD there, well, they're not like factors. They don't have anything in common. And so it's x minus one all times x plus one. So this is the fancy one I'm gonna multiply by. And the reason why is if you multiply by the least common denominator, then you've chosen something that you're your fraction is going to fall away. Maybe I should have done that lower. So just like when you were rationalizing the denominator earlier, we didn't simplify the one piece, um, the piece that we were multiplying that was not the conjugate. Here, same kind of idea. Let's not worry about the denominator and keep it in factored form. So the limit as x approaches zero. Okay, so we're distributing this to each grouping, each fraction. And if we do that, notice the x minus one cancel and you're left with just x plus one. If I distribute x minus one, x plus one to the fraction one over x plus one, the factor of x plus one cancels and you're just left with plus x minus one. All over, and we're gonna keep this factored form, x all times x minus one, x plus one. So you wanna simplify the numerator by combining like terms. And so notice that we have x plus x in the numerator. So bring down our limit. So x plus x is 2x. And then we have 1 minus 1, oh, that cancels, all over x, all times x minus 1, all times x plus 1 in that denominator. So again, I see I'm going to get 0 over 0. And the reason why that is, is because we have like factors in the numerator denominator. Notice here that we have this times x here. There's multiplication in between, multiplication in between all these factors. And so we can simplify by canceling out those x's that they have in common in top and bottom. And so we're left with a limit as x goes to zero of two all over just the factor x minus one times the factor x plus one. So now whenever we go in and plug in zero or wherever we see an x, notice that we get a number other than zero over zero, or we don't get an indeterminate. So we get two all over zero minus one, so that's negative one, and zero plus one, that's one. So we get two over negative one, 
It's the same thing as negative two. So if we had graphed this function, this complex function, um, we would get back negative two as x approaches zero. So is there other ways to find or to like manipulate the problem or is it only with the least common denominator? Um, this one, you can manipulate it. You have to use the least common denominator, um, but you could have done the method to clear the complex fraction a little differently. You could have, let me just not even look at that. We, if we looked at the one over X minus one, Let's get a common denominator in there. And so if I multiply this by x plus 1 over x plus 1 to get my common denominator for the first fraction, plus I had 1 over x plus 1, I need a common denominator there, which is x minus 1 all over x. And so notice here, well, 1 times this x plus 1 is just x plus 1. And here, this is x minus 1, so plus x minus 1, all over my LCD, x minus 1, x plus 1. And then I can't forget about this, all over x. So I'm going to rewrite this a little bit. This is 2x, all over x minus 1, x plus 1. But another way of saying this, this fraction is saying division of x. So division of fractions, you have to first rewrite it as a multiplication problem. So it would be times 1 over x. And that's where it would simplify. I just find that process of um, that method of simplifying complex fractions is, just takes longer to me. But whatever way that would work, and then we could just take the limit like we had done before and get back negative 2. But um, the tricks that we're using, usually the tricks, there's going to be one trick or, or a couple of trips that will be able to manipulate it like this. So let's see. So maybe you're dealing with trig functions. So how about the limit as x goes to 0 of 2 sine of x minus 1? 2 sine of x minus 1. OK, so again, always start by direct substitution, see if we get a real value back. And so if we plug in 0, we see an x here. We have 2 sine of 0 minus 1. Well, on the unit circle, sine is your y value at 0 degrees or 0 radians. You're on the x-axis. Sine is 0 here. So this would be 2 times 0. So sine of 0 is 0 minus 1. So you would get back negative 1. So we could have seen that by graphing it. And so hopefully you guys remember how to graph this. You can use transformations. We know this 2 is our amplitude. So our max would have been 2. Our min would have been negative 2. This minus 1 would have shifted everything down one unit. That's a quick, fast reminder. I'm not going to do it for you. Um, one more. Um, Uh, 
Okay, so you're given the following, you're given information about a limit. And so let's say that you're given the limit as x approaches negative 2 of p of x. They're given that this value back is 4. They also tell you that the limit as x approaches negative 2 of another function, let's say r of x, this limit equals 0. And the limit as x approaches negative 2 of the function p of, well, they say f, s of x, s of x, is equal to negative 3. So it asks us to find the following. So we want to find the limit as x approaches negative 2 of, we're going to have in the numerator, negative 4 times p of x. And then we're going to have plus 5 times r of x. All over s of x. So basically if we break this down using our limit rules, let's look at the limit um, as x approaches 2 of negative, sorry, x approaches negative 2 of p of x. So that piece right here would give us negative 4 times the limit, which notice is 4. And then we have plus 5 times, we can think of this as the limit as x approaches 2, negative 2 of r of x, which that one is 0, so 5 times 0, all over the limit of our denominator. So limit as x approaches negative 2 of s of x, that one is negative 3. So order of operations, simplify. Negative 4 times 4 is negative 16, all over negative 3. Negative over negative is positive, so this is 16 thirds. Uh, what is this concept called again? I want to jot it down for uh, review. Right now, um, we're just looking at limits as x approaches some value a. Um, and here, right, what we were doing right here was using the limit laws. Okay, so it's simple, just limit laws? Yeah. All right, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so that's, let me just see, that's probably a good spot to stop. Um, I have office hours for the next 30 minutes if um, you have any questions. If no one stays behind though, I'm gonna get out of office hours unless you let me know that you, you, know, you need a, a couple minute break and you wanna talk to me.